Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Welcome to the Performance Matters Podcast from GP Strategies. In each episode, we'll interview industry experts, exploring best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hello, and welcome back to the Performance Matters Podcast from GP Strategies. You haven't met me before. My name is Derek Lewandowski. I'm one of the producers here of the Performance Matters podcast, and one of the great things about producing a podcast like this one is that you get to listen to all of the nuanced and cutting-edge industry knowledge from so many of the great thought leaders that we have here at GP Strategies. We know that you've had a busy year and probably haven't gotten to every single episode that we put out in 2021, so we've compiled some of the more interesting and informative clips from the past year and we've put together kind of a clip show. Just a reminder, though, to go ahead and subscribe to the Performance Matters podcast on Apple Podcasts so that you can receive alerts for each new episode in 2022. The first clip that we have for you today is from the incredibly brilliant Kara Halter. She is the Director of Digital Learning Strategy and Solutions at GP Strategies, This is from episode 55, titled Engaging the Modern Learner. It's one of my favorite episodes of the year. And in this clip, Kara discusses what goes into the modern learning experience. And when you're talking about designing an experience, you're not just designing the content. Obviously, that's still important. You still need to figure out what's the right modality, what's the right interaction, what are you asking the learners to do? Of course, that all still is there. But really thinking beyond that to things like the marketing and communication plan and how do you you know, keep the learner engaged throughout the experience or thinking about all of the human interactions that need to happen and how do you manage those interactions. So we typically refer to that as our moderation and coaching plan, really building a support system around the learners for who else they're gonna be interacting with, who's really responsible for keeping them engaged, if you will. So it's all those kinds of things. It's about what are your motivation strategies? How do you start to manage change management that goes along with what they're learning? Okay. So can you give us an example of what this might look like? And I'll give you like a hypothetical. And then, so here it is. Let's say that you're training salespeople on a new product. And the old school version of that might mean you need to show up in this classroom for the next three days, and we're going to tell you everything you need to know about this product, a lot of bullet pointed slides and that kind of thing. What would the learner experience, the designed learner experience version of that look like utilizing the modern tools that that we have today? Yeah. So again, it goes back to what do I have at my disposal? So obviously the, the answer to that might change depending on what client I'm talking to. But let me just give you an off the top of my head idea around that. One of the the big solutions that we tend to go to a lot these days is what we would refer to more as like a cohort based and time bound, but spaced learning journey. So I know that's a lot of buzzwords in, mm-hmm. in there, but we would try to organize something that's not just that three day event or that one time event. And we'd really try to organize the learning into something that might stretch over three weeks or even six weeks and really try to, to build not just like the delivery of content into that, but really build a community, build um, the learning interactions into it so that they're sharing stories with each other They're having an opportunity to practice along the way. They might record their sales pitch on a video, submit it on an online platform and get their peers to review it and get some feedback as part of that. So we might build out a whole variety of different types of modalities that both touch on the self-directed one-way learning style that the old e-learning courses had to have, but also tap into sort of that instructor-led aspect of it. So it really is getting into truly what blended learning was supposed to be about. And to hark back on what I just said in terms of thinking about the bigger picture of the systemic thinking and what are all those extra parts that we'd have, mentioning things like the marketing communication plan, for example, throughout that journey, whether it's three weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, we would want to have communications before the event, during the event, after the event, and I'm using the word event, I just realized in probably the wrong way. So you really want throughout that whole journey, though, you're going to have a communication plan. And that, so that's really reminding them of what's happening, what's new in the organization in, in that event or in that learning experience. What should they be coming back to? And I think it's also about what do you do before the learning experience even starts? Like, how do you get people to come to the event in the first place? So getting creative with 
marketing ideas and things like that. And actually, I one idea that just, you know, occurred to me that's how do you start to tap into the creativity of that? So we had one of our partners that actually distributed cardboard cutouts with an insert your face image on them, if you could imagine that. So like the big boards you would see at a sporting event and things like that, where everybody stands behind the board and you get your picture taken. Mm -hmm. They did that in a miniature format where they sent out these little cardboard cutouts for everybody. People took selfies of themselves and they started this whole like viral social thing with people posting selfies of themselves in these ridiculous cardboard cutouts. And it started like a a whole conversation about what the learning was going to be before you even got into the learning. And we borrowed that idea and did it in another event that we worked on where those pictures actually became the profile pictures in the platform where the learners were taking the rest of the the, the course. So there's just lots of different ways that you can really think about how do you get people engaged? Where does the learning actually start? How do they get to it? How do they work with each other throughout that entire experience? What a great clip. If you have a chance to listen to that full episode, once again, it is episode 55 and it's only 21 minutes long. I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into designing for the modern learner. This next clip is from episode 61 titled, Measurement, Learning Secret Weapon for Driving Business Alignment. In this clip, we hear from Bonnie Beresford, Director of Performance and Learning Analytics, who gives us some insight into the measurement gap. And one of the tools that you use to help folks figure out the how is uh, a measurement map. So explain what a measurement map is and give us an example of how it works. The measurement map actually is going to tell us the what to measure. It is a visual tool. Think of it kind of like a flow chart that connects your learning investment to a business's strategic goals. Organizations are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in employee development, and they're expecting something in return. And it's, it's, it's been the challenge to show that connection. The measurement map takes the goals and, and connects the dots. So you have this visual alignment. And uh, well, Jeremy, it's really easier probably to give you an example. So yeah. let's, let's presume that, let's say you're a restaurateur and you of course want to own and run a profitable restaurant a challenge for many restaurants, but how can we be more profitable? If we ask that restaurateur, how could your front of staff, your front of house team, your your wait staff, really contribute to that? Because maybe the restaurateur wants to wants to train his people to help with the product or the profitability. So the, the restaurateur would say, well, if, if my wait staff could increase the average check for each table, that would be great. If I could sell more per table, that would really help the profitability. You know what else? If they, if, if I stopped seeing meals going back to the kitchen because somebody got it wrong or they served the wrong meal to somebody and that has to go back, all that wasted food is costing me money. So if I could reduce the cost of wasted food and get the average check amount up, boy, that would be great. And then we'd ask, well, what is it exactly that you would think your front of house staff would be able to do? And the restaurateur could possibly say, we have a fine dessert menu and we have a fine wine list. And if only my wait staff understood our desserts and how to sell them, and if they knew how to pair the wines with the dinners and and ensure that people were, were partaking of these higher end items on our menu, that would really increase the amount of check per table. And if we also were very diligent about recording orders correctly and who ordered what and if somebody was gluten-free to make sure that you remember that and let the kitchen know, then we would reduce that number of meals sent back. And now, as the learning person, I know what I need to put in my training. So if I know that it's it's all about restu- it's all about uh, wine and dessert, I can really focus my training on that. And so if we start seeing the number of desserts ordered going up, we can show that the training worked. And we know that if the number of desserts goes up, the average check per table is going to go up and it's going to increase the profitability of the restaurant. So what we're doing really is building a causal chain of evidence between what the business problem is we're trying to solve and getting it right back down to the learning solution we're going to develop and identifying what those behaviors are in measurable terms. That's what we call a measurement map. 
Special thanks to Bonnie for a great episode, episode number 64, Designing for Learner-Driven Engagement. The guest was Ben Keir, a regional leader in the Asia-Pacific for GP Strategies. And in these clips, he talks about the importance of understanding the why behind your learning experience and how to better drive engagement. I'm not talking about a classroom training with an online portal at the end or an e-learning followed by a virtual session. I'm really talking about a modern learning experience, which typically has a few characteristics. You know, number one, they're spaced and somewhat continuous. They might extend over a number of weeks or months or forever. Um, they might include, or they should include a blend of modalities. A, a, this is hence the word hybrid. And, and the hybrid modalities are truly blended. You know, a good, a good metaphor I like to use is a lot of people think of blended learning and especially learners, and they think of a salad where you can see all the different pieces. And, you know, I might not like the olives, but I'm going to eat the tomatoes. And there's like a bit of a pick and choose, you know, like a, we have a lot of my customers and a lot of my experience in the last 20 years in Asia has been learners choose not to do the pre-work, but they do come to the classroom part, you know? Mm. So they have this kind of pick and choose blend, but really the better m image to have in your mind with hybrid learning is like a smoothie. It's all one thing, right? Whether it's I'm watching a video on a Tuesday, I'm attending a virtual session on a Friday, I'm reading an article, I'm participating in some sort of a social forum. It's one singular experience. So that's what we talk about when we talk about hybrid learning. And there's one other characteristic that I want to stress that is different from, uh, I would say, like company-led learning, which is modern hybrid learning is learner-driven. In a classroom, you have a facilitator who is kind of guiding you through it. You have an LMS system saying, be here at this time and this day and mm -hmm. we'll lock the door when you're in. And then it's the facilitator's job to engage you. And we hope that there's magic that happens when you go back to work. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about where I'm continuously learning and the responsibility, the onus is on me as a learner to participate. And to be frank, it's an important topic because, you know, the world is changing. You know, we need to reskill the entire workforce and, and, and traditionally learning budgets, budgets have been allocated to, um, especially around soft skills like leadership development to our top talent or to our senior leaders or to the few rather than the many, you know? And so it's a really important topic of how we can deploy hybrid learning to reach the masses without reducing effectiveness. And so a central piece to that is engagement. A long walk there and I'm back to engagement. I promised mm -hmm. you I'd get back there. When we talk about engagement, because it's self-led, because it's spaced over time, it is not inherently engaging. And, and the metaphor I'd like to use is this, and maybe, Jeremy, I can engage you in a little bit of a, a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Sure. You're going to play along with me here. I'll play along. So imagine you're at home, it's the evening, and you've decided for whatever reason that you want to make a baked chocolate cheesecake. Mm. Right? You don't okay. know how to do that, but you want to make one. What do you do? Okay. How do you do that when you're at home? What would you do if you're at home? Wow. Well... I mean, I'm lactose intolerant, I must admit. So that, so I'd probably first take some lactose. Well, that's lactase, important. But... Let's throw that in there. It's a unique characteristic. Okay. But where so would you I... go to find that information? Well, I would, I would uh, go to YouTube. I would go to Google. I'd Google it and maybe YouTube it. You know, how to make right. this kind of cake. And that's and fascinating. I love that you added in that extra layer in there, which is how do I make a baked chocolate cheesecake for someone who is lactose intolerant? You've got that extra layer of complexity that's yeah. unique to you. And and so you would go on, as we all would, we'd go on Google or we'd go on YouTube and then we'd see results. So imagine these results have come up. Two of the results are just a chocolate cheesecake, not a baked chocolate cheesecake. Are mm. we going to look at those results? Probably not because I want a baked chocolate cheesecake. Right. Right. And then you've got three more results and – all of them are a baked chocolate cheesecake, but only one of them is a lactose intolerant kind of baked chocolate cheesecake. You know, so you're going to go to the one and you're going to ignore everything else that that you're seeing, right? And then when you go into that, there might be a couple of different videos you can watch. One of them is a two-hour video and one of them is six 90-second videos. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want to go to, Jeremy? Which one lends itself most to your learning style? Oh, it's got to be the six 90 second videos, right? I mean, I, I don't have right. two hours to learn how to, I'm just, if it, if the only option is two hours, I'm just not going to make the cake. You, you've got it right. And so what we've just done there and what all of us do every day is we demonstrate modern learning behavior. 
which is that in order for something to be engaging, it's not just about gamification. It's not mm -hmm. just about making the video look amazing or using an animation. They are relevant, and we'll talk about that in a second. The first layer of engagement is relevance mm. and alignment, right? So your version of a, of a baked chocolate cheesecake for lactose intolerant is my version of a, I want to learn how to do coaching but this is just a video that I found maybe on LinkedIn Learning on coaching generally. But where is my version of my, I need a lactose intolerant baked chocolate cheesecake. I need something very specific. I need coaching in this context, virtually, mm -hmm. in, across cultures, because I'm working in Asia. You know, I need it where it's done in 15 minutes rather than one hour. I don't use the grow model. I use a different model. So really in the first way to drive engagement is relevance and the reality is jeremy that just because you've put a program together doesn't mean that you've achieved relevance and so this is why design is more important than delivery when it comes to hybrid learning because if we don't build it in with a ruthless layer of relevance and understanding what people are looking for then straight away before you even mm. get to gamification and those other tools you've lost you have to do a lot of work then to make that engaging. You have to then all of a sudden start to push people through it. Come on, go and mm -hmm. click on it, go and watch it. And people are like, I don't really want to. It's not really what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And so you land in this position. And so, yeah, they're not inherently engaging unless you design it. And I think it also suggests that if the main criteria of engagement is relevance, then in order to know what is going to be relevant, you have to start with the end user, namely with the learner, and really start there and ask yourself, what is going to be relevant to the people who I want to engage with this piece of material? Yeah, it's a good kind of segue into a concept of around like assumptions. I work with a lot of organizations, right? And a, and a lot of different levels of learning maturity in those organizations. But I think a consistent challenge or I'd say a gap in thinking that I come across um, and even though a lot of companies would say, no, we get it, we get it, but then I don't necessarily see it reflected in the decisions. If I put content in the center or I put technology in the center of my decisions, there's an assumption that if I get the right tool, everyone's searching for like, if I could use a Lord of the Ring reference, the, the one ring to rule them all, one magic platform and one magic piece of content from an amazing provider. I want to get the Harvard you know, business school bit, and I'm going to put that together in the one ring to rule them all, and everyone's going to love it. That is, that's an incorrect assumption. Really, what's at the center is the learner. And that comes before I even decide on what content I want to teach. Because when you put the learner in the center, let's use, go back to our chocolate cheesecake example. I could go out and design a whole training and throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at it and then i launch it and it turns out 30 percent of my audience don't eat baked, baked chocolate cheesecakes because they're lactose intolerant <laughs> if i had have discovered that at first that not only would have changed my design potentially but it would have changed the content that i was initially intending to roll out we help gp strategies helps clients vet the market you know often clients will come to us and say can you run an, an rfp for us can you run some sort of a project to go on find us this learning solution, please. Go out to market and, and assess it. And a lot of technology companies, and there's a, a lot of amazing ones out there, but they'll tell you they can do almost everything. Yeah. But the reality is whether it's an LMS or an L, a, learning, a, a learning experience platform or whatever the technology may be, they're usually very strong at the core then kind of slightly good to the left and right of that and then get less good at something pretty dramatically quickly as you move outside those core features or that core use, use case you know, what ends up happening is, is a lot of businesses, both for the desire of simplicity, for budget, but also because what, what they're being told, they're looking for this one solution. And, and in mm. reality, the future of, of learning is really more like your mobile phone. I've got an app for banking and I go to that for banking. I've got an app for tracking my weight and fitness. I go to that. I don't go to that weight and fitness app for my banking. You know, um, so you have apps for different things. So it's really the appification of learning that I think is something that it would be great if organizations got their head around that I'm going to be turning on and off tool sets mm -hmm. in my ecosystem to meet certain needs. All right, these senior leaders need this. They need something very specific. These guys need something else. I need to hit 10,000 learners. That's a different thing, you know. So I think that's probably mm -hmm. where it's going. If, if learners, if, if companies can get their head around that, they'll make better technology decisions. Um, but at the same time, 
I want to stress here that technology is not at the center. It's your learners. And then secondarily to that, also your business. Mm -hmm. What is the culture today? What is the culture we want tomorrow? What are the goals? Those two things together then drive technology and content decisions. And you're going to be more likely to end up with an engaging experience if you do it in that order. What we're talking about is really learner centric, right? The learner driving everything. Learner centricity. Yep. Yeah. What are the best ways that an organization can go about getting to know their learners so that they really understand their needs and can use that information to drive the design? How do you do that? Look, I hate to say this answer because it's it's perceived as a buzzword and I've even had some of our customers kind of roll their eyes at me, but it's design thinking. You know, there's an art to being good at the, em uh, uh, just in case any, any listeners aren't really clear on the layers of design thinking, it starts with empathize, define, you know, ideate, prototype, test. You move through this process. It's an agile process. It's not linear. I might jump backwards and forwards um, depending on different inputs and outputs from the different stages. But in that empathy phase, what we use it for as a design tool is we build out learner personas. So I, I, I've recently um, moved through a learner personification process where we were trying to address a population of 4,000 learners, individual contributors. At, a, at an engineering company. We were able to distill that down to six learner personas, right? And so these learner personas should kind of represent the, the points of a compass for that population, like the most extreme mm -hmm. versions of each, that group, right? Like maybe a more senior person who's very settled, isn't very ambitious, and someone not looking to get their next promotion, very happy where they are. Maybe it's the inverse of that is someone who's, you know, hungry and very ambitious and really driven for that. And, and so what you want to understand here isn't just their training needs analysis, because to be frank, you know, I, I love this story and I don't know if it's a real story, but you know, Henry Ford apparently was quoted saying, if I asked people what they wanted before I released the car, they'd say, I want a faster horse, you know? <laughs> right. And I love that quote because you don't necessarily know the learning that you need, especially if we're talking about future of learning and dealing with disruptions, which haven't come yet, you know? So, um, so you understand those learners' needs, of course, but what's their environment like? What access do they have to, to, to technology? What, what are their schedules like? What do they think and feel when you say digital learning? Some people have a, a, a revulsion. They feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. about it because their previous experience with, with, with digital were mandatory 30, 45 minute really dry e-learnings, you know? And so you've got to understand those dynamics and then that feeds into your design process and you make decisions, not just about the content, but also about how much time, how many minutes should each interaction be? How much can I expect them to achieve in a week of learning or in a month of learning? How do we engage them? You know, all of those different questions come through. So I'd really suggest that empathy process, but not just empathizing with the learner, empathize with the business because change management is another layer to consider when considering engagement. What if the current culture, as I just alluded to, of a business learning culture is traditional top down. We're waiting to be told most of the learning we receive is mandatory. What the company wants us to do. And all of a sudden you're pivoting to this whole new approach to learning. And it's, 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 it's for you. It's an investment in you. It's to help you reskill and be ready for the future. There's going to be resistance there. So you've got to build that change management into your marketing communication, into even the pro the way you launch the program and the modules themselves. The design thinking process is, is effective because it gets you that learner insight at the right at the start. Yeah, absolutely. So what's at stake here? You know, what's at risk when you don't put the learner at the center of your design and your design mm. thinking? Well, I think what's at stake, I mean, there's a lot at stake, right? And there's some very nuanced responses to this, but it comes back to the, the, what I would say the three biggest fears that organizations have um, about deploying modern learning in their organizations. And that is wasted investments. We've gone and we've bought this technology or we've done this thing. And I speak to a lot of organizations who've invested in LinkedIn learning, for example. Their utilization has been in 10 or 15 or 18%. And the reason why is not because LinkedIn learning isn't great. It is amazing. It's got so much knowledge in there, but it's not real. It's not the baked chocolate cheesecake for the lactose intolerance. So you need to build in layers around LinkedIn learning to get the most of it, you know? So, so we buy something and it doesn't work. And then we assume that all oh, blended learning and hybrid learning is not mm. going to work. And so wasted investments that no one turns up. There's this paranoia or fear 
that is also the consequence if we don't do it right that i build it and they don't come like the field of dreams if you build it they will come right it's the yeah. inverse of that they're worried that i build it and i try to build a social learning and no one's in the discussion forums and no one's mm-hmm. participating and the, pl- the platform's empty and you know the last one is probably around just the professional reputation and risk that learning organizations and individuals in those teams take on when they're doing something new it's a risk so that's both the consequences if you don't do it right if you don't make it relevant if you don't create connections if you don't make them social if you don't consider these fundamental design principles then those fears could be realized and Mm -hmm. that's probably the consequence and then the, the the more nuanced answer for the business is you may burn some bridges you know you might get some mm. it may be much harder to then relaunch again that another approach if you don't get it right those first few times because you're influencing learners mindset this next clip is from episode 65 hybrid workforce turn challenges into opportunities with patrick calhoun in this clip patrick talks about mitigating the feeling of isolation which can arise from working in a remote or hybrid environment, something that we all need to be conscious of. Give it a listen. Sounds like like you're raising an important issue in the issue of isolation, right? That if you're not in the same building or the same room with other people, it's easy to feel isolated if you're working from home, say, and you don't have colleagues around. And as you're also saying, you're just missing that kind of the more the small talk element right? Before the meeting begins, afterwards, just those little moments that can make a big difference. So what can leaders do to approximate that, or at least to recognize it, and to try to mitigate some of that isolation? Be in a position where they can listen and communicate well. I mean, that's automatic. I, I think to go even deeper, if you could make the mission and the purpose of the organization part of the work and it, it, it will focus closer it, it draws in a cohesion between the leader mm-hmm. or, and, and, the, and the employee as well or the organization and the employee they get to collaborate closer and, and it drives a level of of common common direction and purpose and thread so it's it's interesting you you call that 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 out about being isolated because you know, remote work can be an island and, and you can, you know, immediately, although you're very productive, you can be disconnected from everyone else because there's so much amount of time. I mean, you think about, I have a client that explained to me that they were going back to work in September and her biggest objection was the fact that she now has to drive and she's gone two days a week. She now has to drive an hour, right, to an hour and a half mm-hmm. to get to the office Right? And an hour, an hour and a half to drive back. She's gotten used to that using that hour right, to be as productive as she possibly can. And so now the organization is actually giving that hour back to the commute that they once owned. Mm-hmm. Right. And yeah. so you, 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 you know, I'll be curious to know. We talk about measurement all the time. Be curious to know if you can measure productivity once you return back to work when you've been in a remote, mm. um, mm-hmm. you know, hybrid environment. Well, it'll certainly be inter- interesting to see right, what that data show, right? That uh, will productivity go up? Will it go down? Will it remain the same? You know, identify those priority items uh, that, you know, need to be done. One, they, they need to be completed. They They have, you know, from an expedited standpoint, it doesn't hurt to have some insights from others, right? Both remote and, and, and in the office, you know, in the sales space, we, we've been doing it forever, right? As a sales professional, think about it, you know, we're in the field. Everyone we, we engage with is sitting in the office, you know, our resources, our, our account receivable payables, our client, you know, client facing customer support, we collaborate with them on engagements for sales. And so, and it works and, and we usually have success when we do it very well, right? So it, it's not hard to identify those opportunities where organizations, but they've, you know, we've just traditionally as, as corporations, we've just always operated as that's a part of your role and your tasks and we want to see you complete it where 
it, it, it you never know it could be uh, beneficial to bring in remote and mm. in office individuals that was a fantastic episode one of my favorites of the year episode number 65 hybrid workforce turn challenges into opportunities this next one is a clip from episode 66 titled staying engaged on a hybrid team during this clip colleen casey who is an engagement and measurement consultant delves into the 2020 data which surprisingly showed that people were actually quite adept at working in remote environments. She also delves into the increasing desire for flexibility. But I do want to talk about the trends that I observed in our 2020 data. And what I saw is that across client organizations, we saw significant increases on some key indicators. And those key indicators were around clarity on work priorities, managers giving feedback to their employees and creating good relationships with their teams, and also senior leader executive communication and the positive perception of that increased over time. So this was the 2020 data, and I think it's important to keep this data in mind because this is indicating how we showed up and how organizations succeeded in a completely virtual environment. And a lot of the things that were the largest concerns for organizations moving into a totally virtual environment, performance, productivity, connection between leaders and employees, not only did we see that we were able to maintain those things, but a lot of organizations were more successful than they had been previously. And it's great to look at that information as we think about how we move forward with hybrid, because when we think about that move to a virtual environment, we had no roadmap for doing that at that point in time, right? We were thrust into this situation in a crisis situation, if we had told organizations, you know, three months in advance, okay, three months from now, you're going to go completely virtual, they would have said this is going to take us two years to roll this out to do this successfully. But we were able to do this with no roadmap. We were able to be successfully successful completely remotely. And I think that as organizations move forward and think about their hybrid strategy, there's no reason that we can't continue to be successful now that we've had so much practice doing this over the past 18 months. I think some other things to think about in terms of what we're seeing in the data and what I'm starting to observe in 2021 trends, I am seeing an increase in employees feeling burnt out. So employees are giving a lot to their organizations, but those individual needs are not necessarily being met. So I think it's important as we think about hybrid and as we think of increased access to virtual work and work from home, there are risks that are included in there. You know, this lack of boundaries between work and the other aspects of our life is challenging for many people. When the kitchen table is where you go to work, where you go to school, where you come together as a family, the sort of mush that people are experiencing can be really, really exhausting. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind. The lack of boundaries can be tiring for people. And then also we know that virtual work means longer days for a lot of employees. So people are actually working harder at times when they're working from home. So when your employee says to you, oh, you know, working from home is great. The time I spent commuting, I now spend working. I spend that extra hour and day working. It might sound great, but is that really good for employees? Is that not increasing their burnout because it's much more difficult to disconnect in that virtual environment? And I think the final trend that I would kind of make sure that everyone has on their radar is that people want more flexibility. They want more flexibility about when, where that they work. And it's something that's new because a lot of organizations, employees did not have that experience of virtual work before. They've gotten a taste of it and there's no going back now. This final clip is from one of our most recent episodes, XR and the Future of Workforce Transformation. In it, you'll hear Tom Pizer talk about the growing comfort level that organizations have in using extended reality for learning solutions. He also discusses GP Strategies VR Escape Room as an example. And I gotta say, as a side, I had a chance to use the escape room and it was amazing. So much fun. It was like one of those team building getaways that you sometimes have, only I didn't have to leave my kitchen. Of course, companies that were perhaps historically not comfortable with people being away from the office or online, um, have had to become more comfortable with that. Similarly, transmissive technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality, they've become uh, 
if if not more curious uh, about it, more comfortable with the adaptation of it in their IT environment and in their learning environment. As an example, our company, GP Strategies, recently conducted an online version of our customer forum. This is a meeting between uh, senior leadership from our our customer ecosystem for them to come together and share ideas and experiences and trends that they're seeing in the market. Well, annually, my team is asked to come in and build a innovative activity as kind of an icebreaker. This year, because everyone was so separated, we elected to use a virtual reality experience. We built a virtual reality escape room and had people sign up and join cohorts. Hmm. They were working in a virtual escape room where they had to communicate. They had to adapt to change. They had to problem solve all the while kind of losing track of the fact that they were from distributed areas across the globe. We had people coming in from, from the UK. We had people coming in from Asia Pacific, Latin America. So it, it really created kind of a, a personal experience. That's it for this episode. We thank you so much for listening, and we wish you a fantastic and productive 2022. The Performance Matters Podcast is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get podcasts and listen on our website at gpstrategies.com slash podcasts.